I'm Phil Rickaby, and I've been a writer and performer for almost 30 years. But I've realized that I don't really know as much as I should about the theater scene outside of my particular Toronto bubble. Now, I'm on a quest to learn as much as I can about the theater scene across Canada. So join me as I talk with mainstream theater creators you may have heard of, and indie artists you really should know, as we find out just what it takes to be stage-worthy. If you value the work that I do on Stageworthy, please consider leaving a donation either as a one-time thing or on a recurring monthly basis. Stageworthy is created entirely by me, and I give it to you free of charge with no advertising or other sponsored messages. Your continuing support helps me to cover the cost of producing and distributing the show. Just four people donating $5 a month would help me cover the cost of podcast hosting alone. Help me continue to bring you this podcast. You can find a link to donate in the show notes, which you can find in your podcast app or at the website at stageworthy.ca. Now, on to the show. Amy Lee Lavoie and Omari Newton are the writers of Redbone Coonhound, which opens at Tarragon Theatre on February 15th and runs to March 5th followed by a run at Imago Theatre in Montreal as part of a rolling world premiere. In this conversation, we talk about the story behind Redbone Coonhound, what collaboration as a couple looks like for them, how they've each found their way to the theatre, and much more. Here's our conversation. Emily Omari, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Um, could you give me a little rundown about uh, Redbone Coonhound, uh, 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 just about the show, where it came from, just to get us started? Sure. Um, so the play is inspired by an encounter we had on the seawall um, with a dog of the same name and breed. Um, it, we were walking, I think it was a Saturday, where we just had copies in hand, and um, this man, this very athletic white guy came up and he had this beautiful red dog and the dog paid special attention to Omari and was sniffing him up and down. And that was sad for me because I love dogs and I wanted the attention. Anyway, this man was boasting about how, you know, how long this dog could run, that he's really scent driven, you know, that he's from the States because red bone coon hounds are not, you know, that... Uh, prevalent in Canada. Well, he didn't say the name. He didn't say the name. Because this breed of dog is not very prevalent in Canada. And so we finally, but, Omari asked, what kind of dog is this? And he responded uh, with joy and confidence, a red bone coon hound. And I said, I'm sorry, what? what? Uh, what? Internally, I was actually more stunned. And then this uh, triggered a series of uh, pretty animated conversations between the two of us that lasted over a few days. And actually evolved into all uh, this book. So obviously the words within that breed name are quite, uh, yeah, you know, they're, they're loaded. They're loaded for Omari and should be for all of us. Well, if in the black community, right, uh, red bone is an expression that black people use to describe light-skinned black people. They say they're red bone. Uh, Toon is a slur that's used to uh, dim d diminish and mock uh, black people. So a black person calls another black person the C word or a coon. Uh, it means that they are sellouts and that they are, you know, tap dancing for the approval of white people. So, and then, you know, the hound mixed in there. That just made me think of like bloodhounds that used to track runaway slaves. And it just it was all a very gross melange. Yeah. It, the first time that I heard the name of the play, that what, what struck me was that it sounded a bit like uh, a vaudeville blackface character. It, it yeah. sounded... Like yeah. the kind of name that uh, uh, somebody who who did that kind of performance would do, and uh, uh, I was immediately like, "What is this? What is this show about?" Um, uh, and and, and it, I had I looked, you know, it was, this is all the dog imagery on it. So I did. It didn't strike me immediately that it was a a show inspired by a dog, um, but the name is definitely something that would spark a lot of conversation. 
um, in terms of in terms of of turning that conversation into this play, at what point did you realize and think of it as as something that could become a play? Oh, well, I know this story. Well, we were sitting at Joey's. I think it was a restaurant <laughs> having dinner. And Omari started pitching me because we are creatives. We're always pitching each other ideas. Mm -hmm. And you started talking to me um, about what is now called the train home, a piece within Red Bone Coon Hound. Mm -hmm. And you you were talking about it. And I thought it was really funny, uh, a funny idea on how to satirize this idea of allyship. Uh, and per Performative allyship. The idea that these black people travel to Canada via the Underground Railroad and they're like, you know, trying to find freedom and they're met, they're expecting Harriet Tubman or like a black conductor and they run into these white Quakers who are like, hello, hello friend, how can I help? All their experiences with white people were so horrible that they're like, uh, I don't know about you. Yeah. And so he, I said, well, what, did, what inspired this? And he said, it's actually the encounter with the dog. And I said, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we use that encounter as a sort of through line that then provoked these sort of satirical takes on um, like pop culture and things that kind of live in each other's DNA because mm -hmm. we obviously, um, you know, we love each other. We've come together, spent our lives together, but our upbringings and where we come from are very different. Our lived experience, oh, yeah. very different. Yeah. So I, and then I said, <laughs> it should be called Red Bone Coon Out because I feel like the title, yeah. it says everything you need to know about the play. Yeah. Um, well, and it, it was the real life uh, catalyst for these conversations. So it yeah. made so much sense after she suggested it. Yeah. But, I so, mean, yeah. I mean, it, it, in creating this play, um, uh, it's 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 like as you as you sort of describe, it's like short short plays, like little short plays within one uh, that are sort of like over, uh, about an overall theme. Um, in terms of, of of creating those, I don't know if you guys have have written together before or collaborated like this. Is that a new thing? And 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 I know that sometimes a collaboration between couples can be a little uh, a fraught sometimes. So how was that process? Well, so we are divorced. Fish, <laughs> <I know. laughs> yeah, we're we're actually separated. There, what you're watching is a, a VR projection. Yeah. This is deep fixed, the two of us. Um, I, I'm actually in Bora Bora. No, no, no. no. I, I mean. We we're, we have pretty like similar comedic and, and creative sensibilities. So for the most part, uh, we tend to agree and we, we laugh and argue a lot in general. Yeah. So <laughs> translating that kind of laughter and argument into a creative process came pretty naturally to us, I think. But but Redbone Coonhound is the first official collaborative collaborative process we we went into since then. Yeah. We've done yeah. quite a bit of co-writing. Well, um, I feel like we oh like see. Because we were probably conceiving of grass. That's right. But we, That's right. That is not yet a play. Right. That That's might true. be the next play. But yeah, we I, started. <laughs> we started writing another two hundred together. That's right. That never made its way to completion because Red Bone Coon Hound took over our lives. Yes, so, exactly. Uh, our yeah. completed work is Red Bone. Um, in terms of 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 creating the show, um, what? Well, how long did it take to to like to get that first draft of these these short plays done? And how many did you have and how many did you end up with? Great question. Yeah, that's a good question. We often talk about this, revisit yeah. the ones that never made it. They're buried in our little writer's graveyard. Yeah, we, um, it took us like a year and a half. How long? Till the first draft? How long did it take us? Well, here's the thing. We we were, uh, the Canada Council for the Arts generally, generously supported the idea of the play. So yeah, we, we were. Got a, we got an explore and create grant. Um, to to just write the first draft and give give us some time to like ruminate on it, and that was I think over the course of a year or two actually. But within that time frame, I kind of went to Stephen Drover at the Arts Club um, just to just to talk with him about Ashley Corcoran, who had just come in as artistic director of the of the theater, and to get a sense of you know what they were planning to do, and just to introduce myself. And I started talking about this play, and Stephen very quickly it was like whoa that's interesting let's talk more about this one um so then they came on very quickly actually which yeah. was nice and they offered us a silver commission to continue developing is, the play and to those who don't know it's really nice it's like it's a chunk of money to develop but more importantly it's a dramaturgical uh support 
and some workshops that are they're paid for equity actors. So it's really like kind of a dream scenario when you're developing a new piece. Because this is a this play was conceived of and inspired by Vancouver too, right? It was yeah. a very homegrown yeah. piece. Um, and I will say that the Silver Commission is really great because the intention is to produce the plays that they commission. Yes. It's not That's guaranteed, right. Right. but there there is, you know, a silver lining or a bit of a lighthouse at the end of the development process there. So we yeah. were fortunate that they did end up producing the play. However, between development and production, a little thing called COVID happened. Yeah. So yep. it's a tricky question because we yeah. we're, we've been working on it on and off, not consistently for probably three years, four years. Yeah. Well, we found out we got, we got the grant when I was in Ottawa for South Korea. So that was 20, 2018. Yeah, about 2018, 2019 is when we started. So and, and then the audio, like the first incarnation of a play that was produced was an audio play version that yeah. happened during COVID. We had a stage reading happen in 20. Yeah. That was part of the Silver Commission, yeah, right? but yeah. the audio play was offered to us as a way to keep the development going um, because obviously the theaters were shut down. So we got to explore the play in a different medium, which was really cool. But ultimately, it's a stage play and we're happy to get back on track with that. Yeah, of course. I'm curious about um, having done it as, as an audio play. Did you learn anything about the play? Um, yeah when it was an audio play that informed the final staged version? I feel like we learned so much because audio plays, obviously it's like mostly sounds and voice. Uh, you're, you're so in tune with the rhythms of the dialogue. Uh, and, and also what is lost by not having visuals. Like we add an entire character in the audio play that was this narrator to fill in all these blanks that if you're, if you're watching something staged, you can just get through with light or projections or, yeah, so, we wrote like a Morgan Freeman type narrator to guide us through this. Uh, you know, there's there's an, a real irreverent tone to the narrator, which I enjoyed. But well, we, we got this amazing uh, actor named Tom Pickett, uh -huh. older, older black gentleman, originally from, from the States. And he has a kind of Morgan Freeman-esque quality. And we had him saying just the most vile shit in this beautiful voice. The dog was a motherfucker. Like, just... It was ridiculous. <laughs> he's so, so good. Yeah, he was we, so game and lovely. But we're sad. Like we, it didn't make sense having a narrator in the stage version, but we did miss him because he was so. Yeah, I think for me, I learned that it's really hard to reverse engineer a play into another medium when you when I didn't have the experience of it in three dimensional space mm -hmm. on a stage yet. Yeah, I think it was interesting to do it a bit backwards, but for me, ultimately, I was just really craving. Uh, the play to be explored visually and in three-dimensional yeah. space because that's that's what it was conceived as. So, yeah, but it was fun. And so, yeah. selfishly, I got to play the my character in the audio play, so that's probably the only opportunity I'll ever get to act in it. So, selfishly, that was fun getting to explore the character. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I, I it's interesting because I I have an audio play that I did a couple Christmases ago that I'm now working on turning into a stage play because you know it couldn't at the time yeah. it's interesting to because having done it as audio i conceived of it as audio and now it's like trying to think of it as as a visual medium as well as a as well as a spoken one it's yeah. a real shift how to take mm -hmm. what worked in the audio but give it more life and more uh, uh spectacle more something it's it's yeah. a it's yeah. a tough little thing to do mm -hmm. It is, I, you know, I have such respect for every single medium. Like, I just, I never go, I can do all of it. Like, I just really think about the craft involved because they just require different muscles, different ways of thinking, visualization, and uh, yeah, so. I, same, I respect it all, but it's interesting because as a, I was primarily an actor before I became a writer and director, and I worked in uh, Thurston Theater, then film and television, and now mostly in animation and video games. So I, I already kind of have that, that cap on as a performer of how the different worlds relate to stories. So it was interesting to me to like be on the other side of it and track, like how do I create a world that can contain a story based on the medium that you're working in? And I learned visually. I'm a visual learner. So for me, it was difficult for sure. <laughs> mm. It's interesting. Do you, I mean, as somebody who works in video games, do you think that, because video games are a different they tell stories in a different way than, say, the stage does. 
you have to move from the action, but you can have you have moments where you can have like the character building, but they're separate from the action. Um, right. How does that sort of what does that teach you about the theatrical medium? Yeah, like playing playing video games. Well, yeah. well, one this is why it would also true. I love video games so much that I haven't owned a system since PS2. Uh, despite, you know, my wife, like Amy knows how much I love them. She's offered for Christmas and stuff to get me a new system. And I love them so much that I made a business decision years ago not to own a console. Because so I was like, you can either work in games or you can play them all day. So that's the first thing. Um, and I think what you learn from video games is I find the well-made ones are a really visceral experience you know, because you're, you're literally embodying these characters. So it helps you get into the mindset of a character in a way that... I don't know that maybe watching a movie doesn't like I, I feel like watching a movie you're like you're watching someone else's journey which is also compelling and interesting but when you're playing a really compelling video game you are living that journey but also that just the the absolute scope of video games like rpgs like i just i remember what, growing up with my brother playing um you know some of those games and i would prefer watching that than any tv or movie because it was just so like all encompassing and so then, and stakes that you're feeling because you are making the choices. Well, and then I think, I'm sure you, if you're a video game fan, I'm sure you've watched Last of Us, the, the TV series, right? Yes. Yeah. Last of Us is the first video game that I watched someone play through in its entirety on YouTube because I found the acting and storytelling was so compelling that I thought it was, and I was like, how are they going to top this in a TV series? And lo and behold, the TV series is incredible. Yeah. But seeing the choices that the writers made, understanding the differences in mediums, how certain things would like, like the book, is it Bill and what's it? Th episode three, Bill, Bill and Frank. Yeah. The, the Bill and Frank story and yeah. how they expanded it and the intimacy of that story, understanding inherently that you can go deeper in the, in the television medium than you can in the game was, I, I learned so much just from watching yeah. the adaptation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I occasionally, uh, you'll, I'll come across somebody who's like, still stuck in the oh video games they're not they can't be art sort of thing and uh because they in their mind it's still just pac-man um and all i can think of is playing the mass effect series and getting to the third game and having moments where i had to put the controller down because it was really dusty in the room you know like those kinds of like yeah emotional journeys that that were we've we've gotten to the point where you can you can do that but i also Definitely get what you're saying, Amari, about uh, the 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 need to not play video games so much because you can really get sucked in. I, I, yeah, to me, it's a testament to how great they are. When I when I retire, that's all I'll do. But Amari also has that personality. I don't think it's a condemnation of like video gamers. Like I think some other he, you know, exercising control over something like that is harder. But Omar, I mean, all of us really, but, but video game addiction yeah. is a thing. No, it's I know. Like a lot of people spend an, an exorbitant amount of time. Playing. I don't know how do they how they function. You know? Yeah, but some people can. I I I have. I mean, I'm going to admit to it. I I put over a hundred hours into Skyrim. I played wow. Red Dead Redemption uh, uh, all through until I was fully complete on that game, and then I went back and I started again. Like that kind of stuff is like. Those games are very, oh, yeah. very addictive. Um, but I've gotten to the point where um, I can allow myself the time. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. sort of like, okay, if I, okay, I've done my day job. I'm going to spend an hour and a half doing this creative thing. And if I can spend that amount of time, I can play the video game. But what I find is that if I start doing the creative thing, I don't get to the video game. But if I do the video game first, I'm never going back to the, to the, to the, to the, to the creative thing. That was that was my discovery after <laughs> Madden. I think Omari just Googles Red Dead Redemption. Well, because I'm I'm I've I i do not think it's Red Dead I'm I did a voice for a game that I always confused for Red Dead Redemption. So I wanted to make sure that wasn't the game that did a voice for oh. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I know that one. I understand. I understand. Uh, I could imagine that they all blur together after a while. Yeah. Um and Dead Rising. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things that I love to talk to people about is, um, the thing that, uh, uh, was their or what, like, what is their origin story for going into the theater? What yeah. drew them to the theater? So I'm wondering if each of you could tell me like, what, what was it that made you want to do theater? 
Well, I come from a very small town in northern Ontario called South Porcupine. So we did not have a vibrant <laughs> theater community. Um, it wasn't until um, the late, great Sue Drummond um, was a mentor of mine. Uh, she brought the high school students to Stratford every year on a trip. So I looked forward to that week. Oh, my gosh, you can't even imagine. Um, it was my first real exposure to theater, and it opened up my eyes. I think the first show that I saw with any kind of consciousness of what theater was and what it could be was West Side Story. And I was blown away by the athleticism, spectacle, the story, the mute. Like, I just couldn't believe that I was watching this happen in real time. And from that moment on, I was like trying to spearhead this drama program. I told Omari, so tragic. I was cast as Joe and Little Women, which is just such an iconic role. Like, I love Little Women. And then it was canceled due to lack of interest. Um, but I know, leap for me. <laughs> but um, that's what it was. And I, I honestly have never veered from that path since I went and studied theater at Bishop's University. And then I was lucky enough to get accepted into the National Theater School of Canada's playwriting program. Um, and I have just been on the journey. But yeah, really kind of odd considering I just didn't grow up. There was no art high schools. There was none of that. Yeah. And I it was just those trips, Stratford Festival. Was there a moment, Amy, just before I get to Omari's stories, was there a moment where it, it, you realized that this was a thing that somebody could do? I think it was the, the feeling I had watching it. It wasn't this separation of they are so um, beyond my capabilities. It was more that I wanted to glob onto that feeling. And I thought, this is a vocation. Obviously, these people are here doing it. And then Sue would talk to me about it. And she was excited by my excitement. And she really fostered it from that point on. So it was really trying to attach myself to that feeling forever. <laughs> like, if I could feel like this, this is, you know, it's like a real sense. It's like, it's one of those you... moments. Like, I don't think I've ever felt like this before. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was it was really West Side Story. Who knew? Who knew? Because I it's don't do musicals, great. but yeah, it's, play, yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, hey. Like, let's yeah. let's be yeah. here. Amari, how about how about your origin story? Yeah. So it's interesting. I always loved uh, movies even as a kid. I have this early memory of like my twin sister loved the movie Annie, and we watched it mm. eight bajillion times. And, you know, I also remember watching by me, and I remember as a kid being like, "Oh, those are like." Kids, but they're acting in a movie. I, I understood on some level that they were acting in a movie and the adventure looked like so much fun. But it was this interesting thing where I was born with um polyps on my vocal cords. So like you know kids that have that like a voice that lose it. Yeah, yeah. I was one of those kids. So I loved like theater and acting performing, but I had this this thing on my vocal cords. So I always wanted to do like drama at school, but my voice was so messed up. That I would always get cast as like the tree or the caterpillar or whatever. And then uh, I had surgery in the third grade and my voice totally changed and cleared up. And I distinctly remember, I've never said this before, I had this uh, teacher say, me, that was, no, it was a school nurse say, oh, your voice sounds great. It's so much better. Like, you'll never be like a singer or actor or anything, but what an improvement. <laughs> and I remember grade three me being like, you'll see. <laughs> I uh, I did the, the school improv team from there and did drama like as my elective all through high school. And then I had this incredible uh, high school drama teacher, like so many of us have, uh, Linda McKenty, who told me like, look, you're a really talented actor. I know you love sports, but you're probably not going to make the NBA, but I think you can do this for a living. And sadly, she she actually died of cancer, sadly, only, only like a few years after I graduated. Uh, and they named the field theater at the school after her because her impact was that great. And uh, that's kind of where I really fell in love with it. it was in, in high school drama, uh, working with Linda McKenzie. But can I say something? Because I think this is so beautiful. This is something I so admire in Omari is mm -hmm. that he has faced that, I think, in a lot of points in his life. But he has never wavered in his self-assurance. And I think that's <laughs> something that his mom... <laughs> His sweet mom has instilled in him. Like, I so admire your confidence. Seriously. 
I it's just, I just, I'm riddled with anxiety and I just self doubt all the time. But he but, is just like, but, no, I'll do it. And you do it. And I've talked about this a lot. Right? And it's not to get all whatever, but as a black man, right, in North America, a lot of people have perceptions of who you are and what you're capable of. Right? I used to get accused of plagiarism in school constantly because I love reading and writing. And I was a really good writer and a really good reader at a very young age. And people could not comprehend that a young black kid with a weird voice was smart, right? So at a very young age, I had a chip on my shoulder because teachers used to try to like catch me for cheating or, or faking. And so that's what it is, is just having to like advocate for myself from a very young age. And that can make somebody bitter and you don't have the bitterness. You just have that really kind of consistent, I believe in myself, which is so. really nice. Thanks, so. I have to say. I'll take my mama. I know we do. We think, <laughs> we think Claire. I mean, you, you've mentioned earlier, you mentioned your different lived experiences. Uh, Amari, you're a black man and, and Amy, you're a, you're a white woman. And, and um, as somebody who grew up, my, my brother, uh, my adopted brother is, uh, is a black man. Well, he was a black yeah. child. Now he's a black man. Um, and so it very quickly realizing as, as a, as a, as somebody growing up that, what was happening to me in the world was very different from what was happening to my brother in the world. And yeah. it's, it's interesting when you can have that conversation and you can like realize that um, there's this, 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 this difference. And I think it's important to know the difference. I remember when my brother um, uh, had this realization of, of as a teenager of the fact that he was often, he was always getting uh, stopped by the police in the town where we grew up. Mm -hmm. Just to you know, the the usual, um, uh, here's a young black man. Let's stop him. Um, and I remember one day he said to my dad, "Well, you know, it's no big deal. They're just doing it because I'm a teenager. I mean, I'm <laughs> sure that it happens to Phil all the time." And uh, I said, "It it doesn't happen well, to me ever." Well, and that was the moment where he realized, "Oh, it is. It is because I'm black." Yeah. Yeah. And my, you know, my parents, you know, they did their best to try to like, you know, we went to Caravana, all that sort of stuff to try to give my brother who's being raised in a white family uh, 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 as much black culture as we can provide for him. But we did not know to have the conversation with my brother. He had to learn that stuff on his own. Um, and, you know, the it's just the the different the different lived experience. Um and the different lived experience is is really one of the things that has created and 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 was the catalyst for for Redbone Coonhound. Um, in terms of of those conversations, I imagine that those conversations that you were having at the time were um, coming from different perspectives. What kind of uh, conversations were you having after that that encounter with the dog? If you don't mind sharing. If I could share something related to what you just said, first, it's interesting that you mentioned the conversation because my mother was a social worker and she was very, very concerned about my safety because I would get stopped by the cops as the other black constantly. And we, we definitely had the conversation. Like when I got my driver's license, my mom sat me down and was like, you're going to be profiled. This is how you have to act when you get stopped by the police to be safe. And on the completely other end of the spectrum, uh, Amy's father not only didn't have to have the conversation with her, he was the chief of police. Of Timmins, Ontario. Retired now, but yes. Yeah. yeah. So our relationship to police and authority figures was totally different based on those experiences. Yes, exactly. And yeah, just interesting how that sort of, and it's just, yeah, you and my dad are. Well, we're really, we like, I, yeah, we couldn't be closer. And, and from, from pretty much right away, like we have a very similar temperament and point of view. And like, I never would have thought you know, a cop from a small town in Northern Ontario would be somebody who I lab with, but he's... But, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's the humility aspect of this whole thing and, and just taking accountability when when it's necessary. Like, again, I come from a really small town. Is not... Well, at least when I was growing up, things have changed. It was not culturally diverse. So I really looked at movies and TV and books and things um, for information, and it really shaped my worldview. On top of, you know, my parents who are really morally sound, like they're just, yeah. But but I think we, we laugh, even though we have very different upbringings. That's one thing with, that we both have in common. 
we laugh about how square we are as a couple. Yeah. Both like, of our parents were just nice people, like pretty, like solid. But I think also class plays a big yeah. factor in shaping someone's worldview and experience. And we both come from the same kind of similar. Well, like descendants of immigrants, mm -hmm. right? Like Amy's family, like Italy, my Trinidad and Tobago. And there's something about that shared experience of like leaving your hometown and coming to South Wales really cool to make a life for yourself. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, we learn, my family learned so much from Omari by proximity to Omari. To, you know, he raises awareness for us and the articles that he writes and the lived experiences that he has. So, you know, my parents are always open and, and so am I to learning and to doing better. Um, and, and I think that's what it takes. It takes a curiosity right. and a will and a, and a humility. Because otherwise, if you're closed off to that and, and vice versa. So the conversations we're having in the play and the way that it becomes intersectional is where race meets gender politics. Yeah. So, you know, Marissa in the play, who's Lucy based on me, um, we talk about the complications of something like football. So There's so much complications with the NFL. Mike's love of football and his choice to stop watching it when Colin Kaepernick, for example, took the knee and took a stand and I mean, but not stopping football for the I mean the plethora of, of domestic abuse. It's, it's, it's I don't mean to laugh. It's not funny at all. But no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But the hypocrisy like I don't I don't know if you're an NFL fan, but like Ray Rice like uppercut his girlfriend at a casino on camera and the NFL suspended him for like a game and yeah. Football fans are just like, oh, I mean, that sucks. What time's the game on? You know? So yeah. it's those sort of conversations. Like, why wasn't that good enough to yeah. stop watching? It had to be this was the thing where, where I was stopping because of that. And so it's just yeah. how these things collide and clash. Yeah. And it's not about ranking. It's not about this is worse, no. you know? No. But it is about, because we have to remember in this play, these are characters who are embodying ideas, but it's also... Yeah private conversation. I think we're used to public conversations about race politics and gender politics, but this well, is really taking two people who trust and love each other, yes. who are working through something deep, something has shifted because and of this dog. Thank you for bringing up that point, because this is no, will this relationship survive play? No. This isn't a, like, are they going to break up? They love each other. They're super solid. This is a two people who really love each other from two different perspectives and cultures. Are having a moment in their in their marriage and in their relationship where they're trying to understand each other, and we often talk about this. I feel like oftentimes when you see representations of race in the media, it's either from one perspective, like you'll watch like a, a black movie that's the black perspective on race, or you'll watch like a white movie where it's like you know the white savior, fish out of water. You rarely see movies where it's it's not like a zany comedy of you know, look at this meet cute between these people from different cultures. It's just these these two people from different cultures who are having real unsanitized conversations. Yeah. S sometimes they're they're making mistakes. Sometimes they're saying things that could be deemed as offensive. And that's the thing. We're not these these are not sanitized conversations because again, they're happening in the private sphere. And, yeah. you know, like we always say it would have been really easy for us to write perfect characters who are not going to be scrutinized or judged by the audience members. We don't think that's real. And, and you know, it's it's like we're saying, we're, we're approaching the play with the same gesture. We approach our life together as a couple with different lived experiences. Sometimes you have to put your feet to the fire a little bit and learn something about yourself and humble yourself. So and really all of that to say this play is ultimately about language. I think yeah. that's also the big. It's about language. It's about extremism, like extreme unmoving attitudes on all sides of the political spectrum. And when I say political, I don't mean like Republican Democrats or the, like, I mean, political in terms of like social justice or social politics, right? It's to me, what, what a lot of our fever dreams satirize is just people who take extreme positions that are unmovable. Yeah, but everybody gets their turn. It's, it's an equal opportunity oh, yeah. skew right. <laughs> no one is safe. <laughs> I think it's you know I'm you're mentioning the the you know you're having the 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 conversations that happen in the private sphere and 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 nobody's like perfect and 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 it's 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 messy and I think that sometimes that I 
to me, the reason why sometimes these conversations that we have in the public sphere um, don't do what we need them to do is because uh, there's always somebody who is too afraid of of saying the wrong thing, so they don't say anything of value. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually the white person who doesn't want to be called a racist. So they don't say, they don't ask a question, so they don't learn anything. So they don't they they don't want to get messy because they're afraid of uh, of that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's so important to just you never learn if you don't fuck up. You have to have the difficult conversations. I totally agree, but I'll also add, I also think we are in a current political climate where even as a black man, I am hesitant to speak against my community on issues that we we might align 90%. If there's a 10% disagreement, I am hesitant to vocalize it because the pressure to fall in line so as you don't so as you don't get canceled is has never been higher. It it's a lot of people, I think equate the creation of art that deals with race and culture with propaganda. They don't like they they what they want is to see their worldview reaffirmed, which there is a time and place for that. You know, if you're marching for BLM and you're, you're calling out police brutality, there's no gray areas, right? You go and you 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 hold your slogan up. But some people don't understand that works of art and or works of drama are about polemics and they're about the argument and they're about so it, there has to be more nuance or else that's not I mean, it's not a play. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so at the end of your your arts club experience with the the, the whole process, which the 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 ability to have uh, workshops and hope, hopefully more than one. Did you have more than one workshop in the process? Or yeah, yep. yeah, we did. That's so rare in the creation of theater in this country. Um, and it and you went to full production eventually. Yep. Through, after COVID, um, after that production. Is the play unchanged from then or did you learn again from the audience in full production as well and, and make changes after? OK, I'm going to I'm going to take this first round because <laughs> it, you're bringing up a point that I think is really important in this whole thing. So, yes, this is a co-production. The Toronto Montreal is a co-production tucked inside of a rolling world premiere. So what that means is um, we've taken or Stephen Drover, I should say. Once Imago was interested in producing it, Michelin Chevrier, the best. Um, Arts Club went, okay, how do we take this opportunity? We've got interest from different theaters here. How do we figure this out? And co-production wasn't an option for the two companies. And he knew that in the States, there was a rolling premiere model under the National New Play Exchange. Um, and it had been happening for years. And it's this insane model and program that centers process through production. So you get this opportunity to work the text through a production, which is even rarer than workshops. And that's where you get the most information is when your play is staged and it meets an audience. Well, it, what's why it's like, well, you, you open in New York, then you go to New Jersey, then you go to Chicago. And, like, and just the, the, the liberation of knowing you have another shot to tweak and you can sit in the audience watch reactions, edit based on that. Well, not, yeah. and not only that, we, so the production in Vancouver is completely different than the production you're going to see in Toronto. I'm yes. assuming you're going to see it, Phil. Absolutely, I am. <laughs> That'd be really funny. Like, you know, no, I'm not interested. I'm playing Skyrim. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't blame you, yeah. by the way. Um, but it's a totally different interpretation by a different creative team and different actors in a different community. That production at Tarragon is going to be the same in Montreal. But the Montreal production is going to have surtitles. So there's mm. going to be a language sort of accommodation there, which I think is fantastic. And also what's not lost on either of us is the demographics of the audiences are totally different in certainly Vancouver and Toronto yeah. and Montreal. You know, Vancouver, there, there's just not a large percentage of Black people who live in Vancouver. Although we brought out more than you normally see in the theater to come see this play. Whereas Toronto yeah. and Montreal are more culturally diverse. And it was always interesting to us seeing what the black audience members laughed at that white audience members might not have reacted to. So mm. to see in, in like Toronto or Montreal, how people. But the other thing that is brilliant about this model is that within the contract, the theaters that bid for these productions or this play 
have to agree to reserve money to bring the playwright to the city right. to continue the process. So the playwright comes with the play. Mm. So that's where those changes come into play because the, the playwright is an active member of, of each process. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, the first production we were doing a ton of rewriting oh, on yeah. the spot. And this we are too less so only because the text was in a better place. But we are learning through the production and the interpretation different things that we want to change. We're changing the ending some nights during previews because we're wanting to find different different moments. And so that's going to change. We have a week between the Toronto and the Montreal one. So we'll go and do more work there. And so what you end up with is just a really... Her dog is right now. Um, is a text that withstands a lot of rigor, like a lot of dramaturgical rigor. And hopefully can... Oh, there she is. Stevie Licks, um, you know, can be, it could have a universal flair to it so that regardless of the cut, the theater size, the budget, the community, it has a resonance and uh, it's just a greater kind of appeal for production. I think that the process of, of, of seeing a play change is, is, is hugely educational. Um, a few years ago, I was an usher at the Ed Marvish Theater in Toronto at the time when Disney was doing their trial run of 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 Aladdin that was going to go yeah. to Broadway um, and watching that them react to audiences from night to night was a fascinating education in how to take immediate feedback and change a play. So it's a fascinating yeah. process to watch. Have you have you found that uh, an enjoyable process or a frustrating one? Watching the show every night, you're saying? Yeah, just like just like like making changes based on audience and, and things oh. like that. Is that something you've enjoyed or has it been more frustrating than not? It's my favorite thing in a play that, that works. I found it very enjoyable to sit in and make changes. Mm -hmm. uh, the Vancouver production of Raymond Coonhound, I went to see more than any production that I've ever been involved in <laughs> as a director or a writer. We saw it. I mean, I saw it. It must have been 15 times. How many times? Not as much. But you directed it. I think, again, you're also mm. very, you know, look at, looking at it from a different lens. Yeah. Because I, yeah. you know, I did go quite a bit because of the rolling premiere model. I wanted to get that information. Um, but yeah, we're going to Toronto on Saturday. And we're going to be watching all of the previews and working with Michelin and Kweku and, um, you know, working on some ongoing notes for the uh, for the show. Nice. Um, just as we as we start to draw to a close, I wanted to ask you about uh, something that is uh, I think that you've just finished. Uh, it, can tell me about Blackfly. <laughs> oh, our beloved Blackfly. Um, so that was a commission for Repercussion Theater uh, again, right before the pandemic started, and it it's our adaptation of Titus Andronicus, but told through the lens of Lavinia and Aaron. And uh, it is a, a feminist hip hop theater satire. It's ridiculous. Like it is a yeah. zany, just crazy play. And what we've done is we've kind of reallocated the violence to the characters that had violence kind of put upon them. Yeah. So Lavinia, it's like a revenge play for Lavinia. Um, it definitely, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to stand for that. Um, you know. <laughs> Happen to her. Aaron uh, indicates not only what was done, but his image and the perception that most people have of Aaron. He he makes a case for why he's totally justified in everything he did, and and the clown just wants to to die to die. He's just and he, <laughs> he cannot, but he can't. He it's can't. A, a running it's, joke. It's he, a running joke throughout. He he thinks death is going to come by him. He's so grateful, and then something happens, and he doesn't die, and he's back to a life of misery. But we did. We were lucky enough to receive a Digital Now grant from Canada Council to develop that into an audio play with animation. So that's in the works. It's going to be released, I think, in the spring. Um, it's going to be an animated uh, play that you can watch, and uh, so we can send it to you. But uh, that is definitely we, we want to bring that back to the stage. That yeah, was its intention. Yeah. I feel like again, because of the pandemic, we've been doing a lot of re re exploring of, of but, work that was mentioned in the stage. It's been but, great. But you know what though? Shout out to the Canadian government and oh, Canadian yeah. Council for 
the way they stepped up for artists during that time. It oh, was yeah. crazy. Like, they, it's wild to me that they actually acknowledged that the cultural sector was important and recognized how much we were all yeah. in the struggle. Yeah. So much funding came through for artists. So. And, I, and what I, I will say, because of that and because of the pandemic and because it was an audio play, we weren't limited to, you know, geography for casting and collaboration. So we got to work with our favorite people like Robert Persichini, Laura Conlon, Tom Rooney, Damien Atkin. Uh, AJ, Alessandro Giuliani, uh, Amitai Wormstein, McKay. Kayvon Koshkin. Kayvon Lenny uh, Parker. Uh, and, uh, oh, wait, James. We can't leave out James Loy. So oh, James Loy. Did we, did we also forget Damien? No, I said oh, Damien. Okay. But, but it's yeah, just we, like we a got, crazy uh, cast. Cast like, that we had no business getting. Like, we were just laughing. I, we like, were laughing wow. at Tom Rooney and Robert, like these Stratford vets saying our ridiculous words. But we just had so but, much fun. Well, like, yeah, everybody, we laughed. Everyone laughed so much during those recording sessions because I think it was, you know, everybody was pandemic down. It's just, great outlet. Yeah, just a really irreverent comedy. One of the things that I think the digital productions has allowed people to do is to work with people regardless mm -hmm. of geography and to yeah. and I I, I, I I have enjoyed the fact that we're able to whether it's a it's a live stream or recorded or or audio play, that we've been able to share work. Uh, yeah. across the country, which is something we don't often get to do. I'll hear about a show often that's happening in Edmonton, for example, that I will never get to see unless I can get to Edmonton. Um, but by sharing it digitally, we're like sharing our work across Canada, which is amazing. Yeah, and you know, I know a lot of people are saying, you know, yes, it's a live medium and you, you lose something, but I love watching well-filmed theater for that very reason yeah. theater is sometimes really inaccessible i and i find it um you know with my brain and the way that it works i like being in the comfort of my home sometimes watching certain types of plays right like the anxiety i feel of being tucked in to an audience and in the middle row like that takes yeah. me out of an experience sometimes so i felt really i i felt so great about just being able to watch theater on my own terms um so i totally hear you on that i did like everyone i missed audiences as well i miss being you know but oh, yes absolutely absolutely but, yeah. but one thing about seeing filmed performances um i prefer those over film like movie adaptations i would much rather see yeah. like, the live production um than uh, an adaptation. I recently watched the Netflix version of Matilda, but I'd seen the live version in oh, New York. Right. And so I much I missed from the stage version that you didn't get in the movie. And it's, right. I, I would have preferred the a filmed version over, over, yeah. over the adaptation. I, I guess hear you. It, it depends to me on the adaptation, but I, I, I cause we, we watched mm -hmm. uh, father, um, mm -hmm. The Anthony Hopkins films, which was a, a, a stage. Well, oh. I have been begging Omari to watch The Father for literal <laughs> years, and I finally managed to force him to watch it. Yeah, it is to me one of the most excellent, excellent films of all time, yeah. and based on a play, but also that the playwright directed the film. So there's a real mm. sense of consistency and vision. And Anthony Hopkins, I mean, he just breaks my heart. I, mm, I, yeah. I can't. So it's a very I, good film if you haven't seen it. And I don't know what the stage play was like, but I can't fathom a rendition of it that's more moving than the film. Well, you know right. who did on Broadway was, I think, or in the West End was Frank Langella. Oh, wow. Which is a whole other thing, but he is Ooh. equal just in yeah. the past. Right. So he's now become a podcast about the father. Well, hey. <laughs> If they could do, if they could do a weekly podcast about the Last of Us, we can do one about the Father. That's right. Let's do it. <laughs> Omari, uh, Amy Lee, thank you. This has been an episode of Stageworthy. Stageworthy is produced, hosted, and edited by Phil Rickaby. That's me. If you enjoyed this podcast and you listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you can leave a five-star rating. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, you can also leave a review. Those reviews and ratings help new people find the show. 
if you want to keep up with what's going on with Stageworthy and my other projects, you can subscribe to my newsletter by going to philrickaby.com slash subscribe. And remember, if you want to leave a tip, you'll find a link to the virtual tip jar in the show notes or on the website. You can find Stageworthy on Twitter and Instagram at StageworthyPod, and you can find the website with the complete archive of all episodes at stageworthy.ca. If you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Phil Rickaby. And as I mentioned, my website is philrickaby.com. See you next week for another episode of Stageworthy. Worthy.